Thanks for listening to Leadership Level Up. I'm Brian Prairie. And I'm Dr. Jeff Williamson. I am just starting my leadership journey. And I've been guiding leaders for 30 years. Our podcast aims to shine a spotlight on outstanding leaders and provide a platform for them to describe their leadership journey and share the guiding principles that have helped them become great leaders. Welcome to Leadership Level Up Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Williamson, my co-host, Brian Prairie. And we have our friend Eric Peterson back with us today for another conversation on the good work that he does with Project Headspace and Timing. And uh, we'll, we'll tap into that a little bit more today. Last time we talked some just about what leadership looked like to you and some of the incredible examples that you shared. This time we want to talk a little bit more about your nonprofit, the organization. Sure and what they do and who they're serving and some of the things they do. So welcome back. But uh, man, I love I love what you're doing and, and who you're serving. It's awesome. Thank you. And I call it like I used to just say it was a veteran organization, which is true. Like we service veterans, but I can't stress this enough. And I say it so often that people are probably tired of me. Uh, tired of hearing it. it it's like we are a community organization because there are so many times where somebody in the community helps us out in such a tremendous way that like we wouldn't be able to do any of the things we're doing today or tomorrow if it wasn't for the way that our entire community has really rallied around us and shown us that support so i really i appreciate you saying that but we've had so much help to get to where we're at right now. You know? Well, and that, that's how it should be. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Um, we were talking before, uh, a while back that, you know, I'm not a veteran, but my son is a veteran. One of my right. brothers is a veteran. And so my heart responds when I learn more and more about what, what you all are doing with your organization. And so I think that there's a lot of those connections there. Somebody saying, hey, my, my dad served, my brother served, mm-hmm. my, my uncle served, my friend served. And so they love what you're doing because of that, even though it's, uh, maybe second level experience for them. But when you get volunteers and people showing up for you guys, that that's that's how it happens. Absolutely. And it's not one of the things that I feel like we've had to get through as an organization when it comes to talking to people and educating the public is like, it's OK if you're not a veteran, too. Right. Because the whole thing is and I don't like the whole I call it like hero worship thing where mm-hmm. people say that every veteran's a hero and stuff. Mm-hmm. And if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. Um, I don't see it that way because I know I know veterans who have gone above and beyond the call of duty to to do things that have cost them dearly and have cost them their lives. And I don't feel like it's fair to say to put myself mm-hmm. in the same category when I look at my service as just time where I did my job. Mm-hmm. But I feel like so many veterans just need to feel like they're a part of their community. And when I've told so many people who've like said to me, well, I'm not a veteran, they say it in this way where it's almost like they're demeaning themselves or something. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, well, you're the reason why somebody served them. You're the reason why somebody right, did right. because everybody has their part to play. That's and the goal point. about making sure veterans feel like they're at home is by making them feel like they're part of their community again, you know, which again, this is the perfect place to do that. As I just, you know, mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I never thought about that, you know, that we have an opportunity as an someone who's not a veteran to like, well, you're the, you're the, one of the reasons they served. Right. That's yeah. a different take I've mm-hmm. never really had. So mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah. Golly. Thank you. Back a few years ago, you um, started your nonprofit, Mm -hmm. Project Headspace and Timing, and we were having a little fun offline asking you if if the PHAT was on purpose, you know, and, you know, like, Mm -hmm. I'm like, um, can I say fat? Because I didn't know if you meant that or not. (laughs) (laughs) Knowing knowing Eric, and I saw that. Take yourself seriously, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I just... I. I, because I knew that if we could, uh, the military loves acronyms, and I knew that <laughs> That's if, true. if I could have gotten fat.org, then that would have just been hilarious to me. And I'm the type, <laughs> I'm in the place now where like, if something makes me laugh, I almost don't care if nobody else finds it funny, as long as I think it's funny. But because it wasn't available which is totally fine. You know, we have project headspace and timing is our, is our website and that's our handle for our email. It's just such a long, mm-hmm. such a long email. I've met yeah. one person that has a longer email than me, but it's just <laughs> when you have to like type it in on a phone or something, you're like, oh, I should, I should have found something shorter. You know what I mean? But yeah. Well, we kind of wondered, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, I wish you could have gotten that. Cause that would have been so fun for you every time to say, yeah, I'm at fat.com or, yeah, or yeah, fat.org. Fat. Yep. They're like, 
came but, uh, from. But I mean, city. where does the name yeah. c- come yeah, from? Yeah, where did like, that grow I, out I, of? Yeah. So my first deployment, um, I was in the infantry, and the end all be all like infantry weapons is the M2 Browning, the 50 cal machine gun, right? Okay. And it's a big, powerful weapon. And to use this weapon, you needed to use this tiny little gauge. It was like two pieces of metal connected by a chain. It was called a headspace and timing gauge. And you had to use it before, like any time. And I heard that because of technology, the way it is now, it's actually something that's not needed. But at the time that I was in, if we mounted that weapon to our truck, uh, we had to use the headspace and timing gauge to make sure that that weapon would fire. Because if we didn't use that little gauge, a round could explode in the chamber. Mm-hmm. The weapon might not work at all. And so I always wanted to call the organization something that another grunt would hear and immediately know, I know what that means. Because again, especially in the veteran community, so much of it's based on trust. And my wife had brought to me, she was like, well, a lot of people aren't going to know what that means. And I said, good, that's the point. Not because I want to exclude anybody, but it's because I want to get that conversation going. I want a grunt in an audience to say, oh, I know what that means. And then someone next to him is like, what does that mean? And then that, that grunt gets to share something that's close to them with that person. Now that person leaves with a new understanding, a conversation was started. Mm -hmm. And again, that, I mean, when it comes to mental health, that's like kind of at the foundation of everything, right? It's just having that genuine conversation. So that's where that name came from. And it kind of served a dual meaning, obviously being that we're dealing with the headspace and the the timing after service to make sure we get veterans help. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna ask you that forever because I was out at an event with you and some, I think it was a veteran. I was like, oh, I get that. I was like, Oh, there's something there. I right. I, <laughs> in a good way, it's like a code phrase to kind of go, if you know what that means, yeah. Yeah, then you yeah. you get me mm-hmm. in a different level. Right. And and maybe that leads to a conversation. Hey, you know, my brother is a veteran and yep. they're going through a hard time and they might need some of your services. And, you know, God knows how that might open doors yeah. for you guys to serve people. One of the coolest things is whenever I would have any sort of public speaking thing and I would say the name of the organization and there would be some like old Vietnam veteran in the back who just stands up and goes, nice. And then sits back down. (laughs) I'm like, that's why I called it that. Yep, that's why. Right there. You know, because he got it right there. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, that's totally worth it. Yeah. Yeah. You see? No, I I didn't know that. Now we're in the know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super cool. Thank you. You do a lot of things for the veterans, but mm-hmm. w- what are some of the things that you are like, like, what are some of the services you provide? What are some of the uh, so, events you put on? So as an organization, it's kind of hard, especially when you start a nonprofit, because I feel like when you, when you start a nonprofit, in my opinion, you just want to save everyone and do everything. Yeah. And luckily I've had enough solid mentors my entire time where they've kind of helped me hone in and focus on specific things Mm -hmm. and then kind of build off of that. So like the three main things we work on are veteran advocacy, veteran outreach, and a veteran village. So the veteran advocacy is a program we're developing where we're working with local law enforcement and hospitals to provide a veteran that's been trained in mental health and first aid in the event they are dealing like the police officer or um, somebody in the emergency room is dealing with a veteran that identifies as a veteran and asks to speak with a veteran advocate. So we're able to provide that, not to provide any service per se, but just to let them know that they're not alone, that it's okay, that they're in a safe place right now, that these people are trying to help. Um, And I believe that that'll drastically improve what we're seeing from the treatment side of things, as far as veterans getting care, receiving care, you know, just again, having that trust. So that's a veteran advocacy program. Uh, the outreach program, we recently just purchased um, an enclosed trailer. We call it Troops on Trails, and we're outfitting it with kayaks, hiking equipment, camping equipment, fishing equipment, just to get veterans out in nature to do things with other veterans. Um, because we believe that a lot of the veterans that we get on the advocacy side that are in some sort of crisis may not be ready to get some sort of help at that moment, which is okay. You have to be the one driving your treatment and you can't do it because somebody forces you. So if we get a veteran involved and then we get them involved with our outreach program, well, now they're around good positive role models, other veterans that are going through things themselves and that are always there to be there for them and they're not going to get judged. They'll be loved unconditionally. And then when that time comes up and they're like, you know, I've been thinking about it. I think I'm ready for whatever it is that they need. 
well, then we're right there and we can help them out. Uh, so that's the outreach program. And then the Veteran Village program, I'm working on a transitional tiny home lodging facility for homeless veterans. It was the first focus of our organization. And then COVID happened. And then we just started getting in, getting inundated with veterans or family members or friends that were like, hey, I got someone that's not doing good in this isolation right now. So we kind of had to shift gears. But those are three of our main focuses right now. That's one of the things I thought about that I love about the outreach program is that, you know, whether it's among veterans or any group of individuals that a struggle with mental health often can lead toward isolation, lead into a dark place. And so right. just the fact that you have outings and activities to where vet veterans can come together and not be isolated so that they are struggling to say, Hey brother, have you ever felt this way? Because I'm, I'm hurting or I'm struggling with whatever it may be. And, and to have a group of people go, yeah, yeah, sure have. There's that we-ness, if I could say yeah. that, that, that they're not feeling as isolated or alone if they are kind of in a dark place. Well, a peer support movement is so important in mm -hmm. general. And mm -hmm. while that's something I think that in the mental health world has only existed past 40 or 50 years, I think that veterans, and I say this a lot, and it doesn't mean to be like in any sort of derogatory uh, way, but like we're very good guinea pigs. And if you look back when it comes to trauma medicine or anything else, you see that what happens in the veteran community then gets taken and then it gets spread amongst the community mm -hmm. because we learn a lot through the veteran community. And I think part of that is, is that the term veteran encompasses arguably the most diverse group of people that could be looped under one label. Yeah. Right. Because you have right. every walk of life, every religion, every, every, everything. Right. And so I think that mental health, I'm hoping is really going to follow the same path. Uh, a lot of the things that are get done in the veteran world get studied by the VA because they want to figure out what's working, what's not. And if they're finding that a lot of these things, these, these peer support groups, these uh, outreach initiatives are helping these veterans, then hopefully it's something that can be replicated amongst the community itself, right? So that's my hope with both the advocacy outreach and honestly, and the veteran village uh, initiative too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense now that you mentioned that was our focus before COVID came? Uh, do you have a sense now to say, Hey, I think we're on track to have that begin to happen in the next couple of years or, or, or where, where is that in the process of becoming? Yeah. So we've looked at a lot of different potential properties to see what would work and what wouldn't work. And we've run into plenty of hiccups and issues, right? Which is fine and, and to be expected. Um, we have finally found a property that we are looking at at this time. We are at the very early stages of the commercial loans process. Anything could happen. Sure. And sure. we still have a lot of things to figure out from like zoning and code. Um, we have visited some facilities across the country and they're all very different. And so we tried to take which ones we thought were the most successful. And that's what we're going to try to emulate. Now, whether or not that actually holds up to Illinois code zoning and things like that, that's what we're working we'll through see. right now. Okay. So while we're working through the commercial loans process and, and everything else um, on the building side, um, that's kind of where we're at. Because I found that a lot of facilities that exist when it comes to transitional care, um, sometimes within the veteran community, I feel like they give a you can give a veteran too much and everybody's different and, and every situation's different. And some veterans need permanent support. Mm -hmm. But if you give a veteran every single thing that they need so they don't ever need to leave their house and they don't have the tools and resources to work on whatever it is they needed to work on mentally, mm -hmm. then what's to stop them from holding themselves in the back bathroom with a handle of whatever their favorite booze is mm -hmm. and then never coming out again. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. our biggest thing with this village is making sure that we have everything on the back end figured out what resources we have to provide for these veterans how we're going to work with them on their finances mental health substance abuse whatever so they can get back to being a productive and constructive member of their community because that's what the veteran needs in a lot of the cases in my opinion and that's also what the community needs mm -hmm. so it's beneficial for both parties right so that's yeah. that's kind of the uh, focus with that initiative that's cool and i was thinking about how in a similar way where your outreach program brings veterans together if there's a community of people living nearby each other, you know, then I think that's a different positive connection of community for veterans to say, hey, I've got neighbors here that have maybe walked where I've walked before. Absolutely. And I think that's that's a 
huge potential there from both the mental health side and just the having respectable housing, which everybody deserves. Yeah, yeah I, I emulate most of this off the James A. Peterson Village, which is in Racine, Wisconsin. And I visited the facility multiple times. And the coolest thing about it was is that every time I've been there, you know, I'd be talking to the executive director there and I would watch veterans come walk by his office and his name is Jeff. And they'd be like, hey, Jeff, just so you know, I got a job interview down at the McDonald's or whatever. I'm going here. I'm doing that. Like they're building things. They're building themselves back up. And when I nice. saw that, I was like, whatever you're doing, that's what's working. Yeah. That's what I want right. to do. Yeah. You know what and I mean? they're sharing that information. It's they're like, happy. I'm yeah. making progress. I've got a job interview. They're excited. And they're sharing that in yep. community. And then that that's that that's the opposite of feeling alone and that nobody knows or cares. Right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's very cool. It yeah. is very cool. Thank you. That's awesome. So um, I, one of the things that that drew me even closer to what you're doing, as I was reading some of the letters from veterans families of some of the services that that you personally have provided to people and the organization but the, there's more to that that we we'd suggest that maybe that'd be cool for you to talk about tell us a little bit more about that yeah i appreciate that so when it comes to veteran advocacy a lot of it requires us to deal with veterans in like crisis situations and it's scary how often it happens like in the past week and a half it's happened with five different veterans most of them local um, last week I spoke at a conference in Chicago about mental health and suicide in the veteran community. And after I got off the phone, I missed a phone call from our local hospital Riverside who, and we worked together because they had an issue where they needed some additional assistance on. And so it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to paint it with broad brush strokes because every situation is different. And I never try to go into any sort of situation to tell this veteran, like, I'm going to save you and we're going to whatever. It's just trying to get where that veteran's at in that moment in time, figure out what it is that motivates them and drives them. And to figure out if there's any way that they're willing to get out of this themselves. Because one thing I had to tell myself and I had to tell all of our veteran advocates that worked with us is like, we can't make anyone do anything. And so if you have somebody that's struggling with mental health, with substance abuse, whatever it is, if they don't want to fix it, you can't fix it. Correct. They have to want to fix it. And I learned that early on when I would bring veterans to rehab programs and they didn't necessarily really want to go, but they just thought that they had to go. And then they got out and they were right back where they were before. Mm -hmm. And which is why I felt like it's so crucial to have that outreach component because it's like, okay, if you're not ready to go, that's on you. Let's go kayak with a bunch of guys that half of them have been through programs that they can also talk to you about if you're curious. And that the advocacy portion was also what weighed on me the most as far as causing my own issues with self-care because i realize and i genuinely feel that when you help somebody especially with like mental health or anything like that you're giving them a piece of yourself and if you continue to give those pieces away and you never refill them like i said earlier you can't pour from an empty cup mm -hmm. and some of those situations can get so scary especially when it comes to substance abuse uh, we had a veteran that was addicted to a substance for a number of years and it was methamphetamines. And this was from out of state. And we've worked with veterans in five states now because of, again, that trust thing. And the veteran was exhibiting signs that would look like he was trying to barricade his family in the house mm -hmm. or he had plans to. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get up there with another veteran. Mm -hmm. We had to be there. We got the family out of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to that veteran, talked him down. We, have ended, we ended up getting him to go to an inpatient facility. Uh, I, I had to take his weapon mm -hmm. and do a lot of other things that were just so scary in the mm -hmm. moment. And when we left that veteran's house, the other veteran advocate that was with me he said to me that that reminded him of the movie, the Amityville horror. And I told him I was thinking of the movie shutter Island because it was like mm -hmm. to deal with someone that's dealing with mental health issues or substance abuse. Sometimes you feel like you're not dealing with a person at all. And it's mm -hmm. just a very scary situation. So it takes a very certain type of, of person to be able to deal with that type of thing, which is why I feel like the crisis intervention types of programs are not nearly as prevalent as the more, uh, not retroactive, but things to do after the fact and the peer support groups and things like that. Okay. And so we've responded to, I don't know how many calls now. Um, the last one was, uh, the one that I did last week was a veteran that had threatened to kill himself, was inebriated, 
called a friend, told his friend he was going to do it. His friend reached out to me. And then I called the veteran. And all I had to do in that moment was keep him on the phone long enough for the cops to get there. Mm. And so, again, it's like it's it's surreal sometimes. But when you feel like that is what you were put here to do, um, as hard as it may be, it's still something that you it's still work that you feel is, is worthy of your time and that you enjoy doing. And I'm very careful to use the word enjoy, mm. but it's something that it's I'm very meaningful. passionate about. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, and we've had other folks on our, on our podcast too, as they've talked about whatever they're doing with their work or their life, or their nonprofit, whatever is the, the word of calling even mm-hmm. coming up to say, I just feel like this drew me toward the need. So important. And it sounds like that's something you understand yeah, and just absolutely. say, you know, I didn't so much choose this pathway as it chose me because of my own journey, because of people I was seeing that needed help. And so I just walked into that because yeah. the need yeah. was there. I never wanted to start a nonprofit. Yeah. Like, and that's maybe that's a terrible thing to say, but no, like I never no. had any intention to, I was working as a private investigator. Mm-hmm. I liked doing that type of work. I was going to just continue doing that. Mm-hmm. And I was looking for organizations that would do exactly what I needed them to do. And they weren't. And so I was like, okay, I, I guess I have to start my own <laughs> yeah. thing now. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah, that was a difficult decision to come to, right. but one I'm very thankful of. Well, you often hear people to say that it, it's a matter of what the why is. And I know you yeah. sh- shared and and mentioned even on your website about losing a friend uh, who had made that decision in their life. And, and I think I'm, these are my words, not yours. Mm-hmm. I think that was a, a, maybe a crossroads where you just kind of thought, okay, I've got to do something other than just be sad and grieving my friend. There's, there's a systemic problem here that I don't see getting met to the need it should be. So I'm, I'm going to start that nonprofit, not because I want to start a nonprofit, right? Because I've lost somebody important to me and this could be avoided if we had the right services in place. Right. Well, and to right. your point, one of my favorite things in a book that I turn to often is a man's search for meaning by Dr. Victor Frankel, right? Great book. And preaching, man. Dr. Frankel in that, that book, what does he say? He says that those who have a why can bear almost any how. Yeah. Right? Like incredibly important book. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it's not that necessarily I thought that the services weren't being provided. It's Mm -hmm. that I found a community that was incredibly supportive of its veterans, Mm -hmm. but didn't necessarily know how to show it. And then I had veterans that needed that support, but didn't know how to ask. And I saw what I also call the Netflix effect, which is where um, there are so many resources that it almost gets complicated and intimidating for somebody to even try to parse through everything to figure out what they want to do because like netflix they found it in 1999 they used to send dvds out to your house right in one year when they first after they first started way before they were doing streaming they had like 5400 titles and now they have i think over twenty thousand. but when they had 5400 titles they realized as a company that they needed to create an algorithm to help people figure out what they want wanted to watch And, and that algorithm now they have multiple algorithms and that's what they use well, if you look at how many veteran nonprofits there are, last time I checked, according to GuideStar, uh, which is a website that has all that information, there was like roughly 45,000 veteran nonprofits. Right. Yeah. So it's well, like, how are you going to get help? You're yeah. Google mental right. health. Right. And then what are you right. going to do now? And, yeah, you know? and you're having some issues. The last thing you want to do is make a, a decision on 4,500, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. 45,000. Right. 45, 45,000. Yeah. 45,000. Yeah. yeah. So, so many. Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to create something that also kind of served as that Netflix algorithm. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, where we work with all of these other organizations. Yeah. And I'm glad to point you in the direction of whatever it is you need based on what you tell me you yeah. need. You're the yeah. hub that yeah. kind of connects people yeah. to that. That's perfect. That's well, man, that, that's fantastic. That Thank is. you for putting, I was thinking as you're talking about that, you put a face and a name and an organization in place so that people, not just in our community, in our area, but in states away, yeah. They can cut through all the chaos and know I need to call Project Headspace and timing yeah. because that's that's what you do and that's that's that personal connect. I just saw that coming through so much from the letters and people that posted uh, you know, what you guys have done for them. What can the community do to help you? So, the community's done so much already. Honestly, if the the best way that we can receive help is by 
the community following the different initiatives that we're doing and supporting in whichever way they feel comfortable supporting. Obviously, as a nonprofit, it's always great to have donors and sponsors on anything that we're doing, mm-hmm. but we also need help in a lot of other different ways. I mean, for we do mental health training classes and to be able to provide a meal for everybody, we've had organizations come out and just donate food and that's mm-hmm. great for stuff like mm-hmm. that. So, I mean, I would recommend if anybody wants to continue to support us, to follow us, uh, our Facebook page, Project Headspace and Timing, uh, or projectheadspaceandtiming.org. We're constantly posting up all of our events on there. We have just developed our outreach and volunteer forms. So if anybody wants to sign up for anything, that they can do so too. And just make sure that they're following the things that we're doing. Um, this community has been amazing at reaching out at times where we needed it most and in ways that they wouldn't even know that they did. And one super quick story if i can share it sure uh case in point i'm gonna call him out jim johannick from jimmy joe's barbecue (laughs) yeah so he was one of the first people to do something for us and what had happened was and i was having a rough day because of just life and starting a nonprofit. i have two daughters you know what i mean like sometimes you just have those days yeah so he reached out to me one day out of the blue had no reason to do this and he just said hey eric i just want to let you know i sponsored a hole for this golf outing for project headspace and timing And he doesn't understand this. And I've told him several times, I was like, man, you don't understand what that did for me in that moment. And to sponsor that whole, it cost him like, I think a hundred bucks or something, which to some people might be nominal, whatever. But to me, it was so important that he did that. Yeah. And it was so amazing that he did that. Like those little, little shows of support mean so much more than I think people really realize. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, just following us, checking us out on our social media pages. We have a podcast, I'm Fine. Uh, it's a mental health podcast, sort of. And uh, following us there is the best way they can support us. Cool. Yeah, thank you for asking yeah, that. Man. This is a conversation we could go on and on, I'm sure. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> but we, we need to land the plane. Yeah. But uh, again, thanks for, for all you've done and are doing for veterans and for our communities. Because as you mentioned, we're a community organization and not just veterans, but right, everybody yeah. that interacts in that community. That's part of what you do. Absolutely. It's terrific. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks for being here. here. Of course. Anytime. I really look forward to it. I really appreciate it being on here. So thank you guys. Thanks so much for listening and joining us on Leadership Level Up podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Leadership Level Up. Please subscribe so you don't miss future conversations with great leaders.